Mara. Good morning, everyone. It is so nice to see so many faces. Uh, it's 8.30 at my time, so, um, you know, early in the morning. Good good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I see some folks already dropping um, dropping some, some greetings in the chat, so please uh, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, and Emily wrote, happy elephants to all, and I say, happy elephants to all, genuinely. Um, this has been a week of the doth. Uh, when I agreed to do this um, this morning review, I did not process what what we would be doing this week. So to give just a, a quick overview of what we have done this week, um, we started out talking about consent um, as it relates to the age of enslaved women and betrothal. Then we talked about the designation of an enslaved girl as a future wife to her enslaver or um, his son. We then discussed whether you can be sold into slavery to relatives, um, and if so, which kinds of, elative, of, of relative, relatives. Um, we, by right, relatives, elephants, it's all coming together. Um, we talked about the distinctions between Canaanite and Israelite slaves as articulated by the rabbis, how one might be able to emancipate oneself. Um, we spent some time discussing a brighta on how enslavers should treat their enslaved people, a uh, discussion about why someone would have to sell themselves into slavery, the questions we shifted then to buying and selling of houses and fields in different, um, in different geographic configurations, the ritual of ear piercing as a way to choose to stay enslaved, uh, rules specific to a priest who is enslaved. We talked about the laws of um, the beautiful captive woman. We talked about then shifting to Canaanite slaves in particular and how they are acquired, transferred, and emancipated. From there, we shifted to talking about non-human animals and their acquisitions. So, so really just this like huge stew of really complicated, um, really complicated and, and I think very morally troubling to a lot of us um, uh, issues. Now, today in our time together, I really wanna focus on one specific piece of this complicated stew. Um, and it's the question of slavery as literal um, and also as metaphorical and what that means for how the rabbis think about God. Um, so I'm gonna drop a link in the chat. This is just to um, some of the texts I pulled from Safaria for us to look at together. And um, Mara, it looks like I can't share my screen. Is that something we can make happen? Yes, you should now have access to sharing your screen. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. So hopefully you are now seeing my, um, my Safaria version of this handout. Is that what you're seeing? Yes, we're, we're seeing the uh, Google Doc. Fabulous. Okay, so if you'd yeah. rather be seeing this on your own end, you can always open it up, but this way we have a sort of shared text to look at. Um, and the first thing I wanted to look at was this piece, just this one line from Kiddushin 23a, where it says, um, and, and we actually get this line a couple of times in the daf, um, we heard that the rabbis say it is in the slave's interest to go out from the master's authority to freedom. Um, and, and this line is really striking to me because one thing that I often am, you know, we get these wonderful emails and engagements when we write for, for my Jewish learning. This is like the most warm community of, of shared learners. But I often hear people say, well, but slavery back then was different and maybe it wasn't so bad. And remember that, that bright uh, about, um, about how you know the high standard of treatment for for enslaved um, enslaved people, and then here we get this statement 
where the rabbis just simply say, right, like people don't want to be enslaved. It's not good to be enslaved. Um, and it is better to not be enslaved. Which, like, on the one hand, yes, correct, obvious, but also like a powerful statement of fact in a world where people were enslaved and other people owned enslaved people. So I thought this was just a really striking piece, um, in particular because it comes after a discussion on Kiddushin 22b. And that's what I really want us to focus in on um, in our time together this morning. So the context of the discussion in Kiddushin 22b is um, that discussion about the ritual of ear piercing. And, and just for context, according to um, according to the Torah, if uh, an Israelite slave, right, an Israelite slave should be freed after seven years, um, and if they choose to stay enslaved, and I think actually, um, I don't remember, was it Rabbi Passo who wrote a beautiful piece this week on why somebody would choose to be enslaved. I don't remember if it was Rabbi Passo. My apologies if it wasn't. Um, if somebody chooses to stay enslaved, then, um, then there is this ritual where the enslaver takes them to a doorpost and basically pierces their ear. Um, as a as a sign that they will stay enslaved. So the Talmud is talking about why that is. Um, and I'll just read the first piece here. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai would expound this verse as a type of decorative wreath, uh, meaning an allegory. Why is the ear different from all the other limbs in the body? The Holy One, blessed be he, said, the ear heard my voice on Mount Sinai when I said, for to me, the children of Israel are slaves and not, not slaves to other slaves, right? If we're all supposed to see ourselves as enslaved to God, then we shouldn't have an intermediate. We shouldn't also be enslaved to people. And yet this man went and acquired a master for himself. Therefore, let this ear be pierced. So I want to stop there and just ask sort of, what do you make of this tradition? Let's, let's get some ideas either in the chat or maybe if some folks want to raise their hand and we can uh, we can figure out how to call on you. What do you make of this tradition? Leah, are we are we able to unmute Leah? You're yeah. unmuted. Okay. There is a difference between being uh, Adonai, and really a slave to be a, being a servant of Hashem and being a slave to Pharaoh. And I think that's what's being brought out here. But what bothers me is then if someone for the sake of an, a non-Jewish slave, for the sake of wanting to keep his family together, endures this and then is castigated for it. Uh, uh, it bothered me very much because, yes, there is definitely a, a two-tiered system here going on. But I love these uh, analogies, these allegories, why the ear and then also why the doorpost. Uh, it's, it's well, you know, the, the uh, allegory is good in that respect. But it also uh, puts up a roadblock. Uh, it almost it castigates anyone who would rather have the so-called secure life of a slave and not have to fend for themselves. Uh, it makes them almost a second-class person. Yeah, I think that's a really um, a really powerful reminder that. You know, we create this system where there are people who would um, who would essentially, if they wanted to keep their families together, not really have a choice. And then we say, we're going to blame you for the choice that you've made because you don't have a choice. Yeah. 
And I was seeing a lot of questions in the chat. So I actually think it's probably worth us taking a giant step back for just one minute. A lot of folks are wondering about the difference here between the Israelite slave and the Canaanite slave. Um, and I think it's really important for us to sort of be aware of two things. One is that the Torah lays out a really clear um a really clear set of differences in how um, Canaanite slaves are are made enslaved and are treated, and Israelite slaves, who maybe are more um, more accurately sort of they, they're thinking about, is um, as sort of debt people who are enslaved due to debt. Now, I want to I want to hold two things. Um, I want to hold two things at the same time. One is that the Torah makes that distinction. And the second is that I'm hearing a lot of folks in the chat really um, having trouble figuring out when the Talmud's talking about which one. Um, and if that was hard for you to figure out when we're talking about which one, um, whether you're reading it in the in the Hebrew and Aramaic, whether you're reading it in a, a different translation, I would say correct. That is hard, um, and there's a reason that it's hard. Um, so there's a wonderful scholar whose name, uh, she is a historian of rabbinics, whose name is Catherine Hesher. Um, I put it in the chat on the off chance that you are not currently in my head uh, and know what I, how to spell things uh, that are in my head. Um, and she wrote a book, I want to say it's called Slavery in Late Antiquity. It might be called Slavery in Late Antique Judaism, where she collects all of the places where the Talmud talks about the different types of enslaved people. And she points out that actually a lot of the time the Talmud's not clear. Um, and that if we put that together with the archeological and historical evidence, it's, it's very not clear um, or maybe I'll put it this way. We don't have evidence that late antique Jews were actually treating enslaved Jews differently than enslaved non-Jews. Um, and later translators and medieval commentators are going to do a lot of work to try to entangle those two things. But it's not clear that the rabbis in the Talmud uh, are doing that work or that it's reflecting the actual lived reality in their time. Um, you're welcome to, to go forth and find the book. Um, you know, I, I'm giving you the one sentence version, but, but what I do wanna say is if you felt like I'm having trouble untangling these, um, lots of scholars have noted that that's probably because they were not as untangled as we would want them to be in this time period. Um, so, uh, let's go back now to um, to Kiddushin 22b, and I'm seeing some other thoughts in the chat. Um, so, um, Lynn, you never got your ears pierced when you were 13 because of this. And I think we're seeing here, right, we're seeing some really, um, the idea that ear piercing in particular is a bigger theological statement than perhaps we uh, we want to imagine. Yes, I I you are not the only one for whom that happened. Um, Merle suggested that this sounds like we're kind of making the ear imperfect because now we're changing our relationship to God, right? That that the choices we make, whether or not they're be, they're part of a system we are um, we didn't create it have real theological importance for how we think about um, God. I'm seeing some, and our relationship to God, I'm seeing some other folks say, um, say that, um, well, is this really, should we translate this as slave or servant? I would say if you aren't getting paid money, you can spend yourself and you don't, have the ability to leave. I think slavery is the right um, is the right model. Um, a servant can quit. A servant can uh, take their family and move. Um, and a servant gets paid and gets to keep the money and do what they want with it. Um, and all of those are things that the Talmud here does not give. Um, does not give um, the the 
person who we're talking about here. Um, and all of that is assuming, right? And, and Saul raises this point, and I think it's it's so important, right? All of this is assuming that it is reasonable to make a distinction between different kinds of enslaved people. So I want to go back to Kidushin 22b here, right? Why is the ear different? And it's because, right, God says this ear, meaning the ear of the um, the Jewish person, heard the voice on Mount Sinai who said they are enslaved to me and they've found themselves another enslaver. And again, all of the points, right, Laura is is pointing out in the chat, many enslaved people didn't um, choose to become, right, the idea that they chose to become enslaved at all may be a false, uh, a false assumption. In fact, I would say probably is a false assumption, but yes. Um, let's keep going and look at the second part of the tradition that I wanted to talk about today, and then we'll pull them all together. Um, and Rabbi Shimon um, Bar Rabbi, and that's Yehuda Hanasi, would likewise expound this verse as a type of decorative wreath. Why would the door and the doorpost different from all other objects in the house? The, the person who is um, continuing their period of enslavement beyond the six years, is their ear is pierced specifically by and all at the doorpost. Um, so why why that? The Holy One, blessed be he said, the door and the doorpost were witnesses in Egypt when I passed over the lintel and over the two doorposts. And I said, for to me, the children of Israel are slaves and not to be slaves to slaves. And I delivered them from slavery to freedom. And yet this man went and acquired a master for himself. Therefore, let him be pierced before them. So, Let's put these together and and now let's let's ask that question again. What what do we make of these two traditions together? This idea that all of us should see ourselves as enslaved to God and that that would make any other kind of enslavement inappropriate. Let's put some ideas in the chat. Okay, I'm seeing Lynn suggest that here we we're really uh, we, we need to really understand this dramatic power imbalance, um, right? That that when we think about someone who is enslaved and someone who enslaves, there is this huge power imbalance and a very specific financial relationship, and that that might help us think about um, this isn't Lynn, this is me, uh, right? Thinking about that power imbalance can can tell us something about how they're imagining their relationship as um with with god um okay i'm seeing um sharna writes i love the midrash jews should never be slaves again and it's always the second choice even if there's no good first choice i i would go even further and say I, my assumption is that that us on this chat today think no one should be enslaved again um, and and so thinking about this metaphor as a as a bad second choice, yeah. Um, I see some folks suggesting, well, this metaphor of enslavement to God is not necessarily helpful to begin with, right? Lynn notes that enslavement here is is defined as transactional and our relationship with God is is not just transactional or is not transactional at all, or some group of people at some point entered into a covenant with full consent um, as the rabbis think about it. Um, yeah. Is this a partnership? Well, I'd like to think that in a partnership, everyone gets something. It's not clear to me that, that an enslaved person would have thought of themselves as being in a partnership. Um, which is to say, it's actually pretty clear to me that an enslaved person would not have thought of themselves as being in a partnership. Um, and I, I would go so far as to say, I think that's also clear to the rabbis. And, and uh, right, if at a partnership where 
both people benefit, we wouldn't get on Kiddushin 23a. It's in the slave's interest to go out from the master's authority to freedom, right? They're recognizing that actually it's not ideal, not appropriate. But as Saul points out, slave be right, uh, uh, continuing slavery might be the only way to keep your family together um, in ways that I think those of us who know American history um, might be understanding all of the ways that enslavement threatened families in particularly uh, fraught ways in different periods of time. Um, I'm seeing Claudette's hand. Can we unmute Claudette? Yes. Hello. Um, my, I have a question. I know in in different cultures and in society, nothing has happened in a vacuum. I always wondered if any other ancient societies used this process of pierced ears and whether the pierced ears had something to do with their worship of their God or something like that. That's a wonderful question. Um, I don't know is the answer. I think it's a it's a wonderful question. I don't know the answer to. Um, specifically in the time of the Torah, um, right? So we would be looking there at Akkadian or Sumerian parallels, perhaps. Um, I'm a scholar of Talmud, not of the Hebrew Bible. And I, I genuinely don't know. So I don't want to make something up. Um, what I will say in the Torah, we do see another group who have a symbolic ear ritual, um, and that is the priests, the Kohanim, when they are consecrated as, as priests in Leviticus and Vayikra. There, they have a blood put on their ear as a sign of their being um, heightened servants of God. So within the, the logic of the Torah, we do see ear symbols, um, ear symbols showing some kind of status change, but I don't know whether that would have been found more broadly. It's a really good question. Thank you. So I want to, um, in our time, I want to shift us. I don't want to sort of end there. I think that's a, a bummer place to end. So I'd like to to take our last seven minutes to share um, to share something that uh, hopefully we can take with us in, into our week. Um, and I want to share a, a piece of text that I'm guessing nobody has really thought of before. So I have a colleague at St. Mary's, Dr. Allison Gray, who recently wrote a book called Reforming the Household of God, um, which is a book about how Paul, um, Paul uses metaphors to talk about the relationship to God. Um, and Paul, for those who are um, unaware, Paul is um, a pretty important um, author in the New Testament. Paul was also a first century Jew, right? Um, like, like all uh, of the first Christians, Paul was a first century Jew. And, um, and so I think we can learn something about ancient Jews from Paul's writing, even though like, it's a little weird to say like, now we're going to look at you know, these Christian texts uh, in a Dafyomi, um, in a Dafyomi context. But you know what, we're, we're going to be a little weird today. So in her book, Dr. Gray points out that the early Jewish metaphors that Paul uses um, about different kinds of relationships to God meant particular things in the world in which they were being used, right? When Paul or any first century Jew says that we are enslaved to God, that meant something in a world where slavery was real and live and, and people either owned enslaved people or knew that one financial disaster away, they might be enslaved people. Um, and so what Dr. Gray does in that book is she proposes other metaphors that might be more meaningful today, right? When we just sort of use these metaphors, but we divorce them from their context, um, we're sort of losing the resonance. And so she, she suggests a set of, and she invites people to come up with a different set of metaphors to understand a relationship to God today. 
And that really struck me as I was preparing for this because we get these two fascinating statements, right, that, that we just looked at. One, slavery is objectively bad. Um, and that's not me in my mo- in my moral, you know, 21st century, right? That's the Talmud on Kiddushin 23a. Slavery is bad. It is better not to be enslaved. And 22b, we are all enslaved to God. What are the rabbis doing there? And what are the ways that that metaphor may or may not be useful? Um, and this partic- this struck me as particularly acute, particularly urgent, because um, as Mara and I were talking before you all joined, we're coming up on the high holidays. And if you look at the traditional liturgy, it is filled with metaphors to God. Um, it is fit of, of our relationship to God. And it is specifically filled with language about us as enslaved to God, that we are God's enslaved peoples. And I wanna be clear in the time that these texts were written, that meant enslaved. It didn't mean servant, right? It really did. Um, and so I wanted to end our conversation with um, with um, with an invitation to think, what, what are the ways that these metaphors might still be useful? Um, and given that the rabbis themselves say, wait, maybe it's not always the best metaphor, um, then what does that mean uh, for the other kinds of metaphors we might want to highlight going forward, right? The liturgy is filled with metaphors. Are there other metaphors we think might be more useful? Um, and I saw some folks ask for the, the name of, of Dr. Gray's book. I put it in the chat. Just so you know, this is a book that is written for a um, a Christian community to sort of do work within the community. So if you're looking for... Um, if you're sort of good, you might be surprised if you're if if that's what if you don't know that going in. Um, it's a wonderful book, but it is a book with a very specific purpose. Okay, so Daniel suggests perhaps we we shift to a metaphor of partnership, right? That God, God and Jews need each other to contribute. Um, wonderful. Um, because apparently today is the day of book recommendations, um, Mara Benjamin, Dr. Mara Benjamin, whose name I just put in the chat, has a recent book which suggests exactly what it might look like to think about our relationship with with God as caretaking, where we take care of each other um, in really powerful ways. Are there other ways that we think co-creators, Nancy, that's beautiful, Right, co-creators in in that way where we've already seen, um, where we've already seen in the discussions of you know where babies come from in the Talmud that there are three co-creators in that process. Yeah, what does it mean to think of God as a co-creator? Um, Avinu and Malkinu, our father and our king, right? In a world where many of us have parents? What, what, what might it mean to think about God as parent? Now, king is interesting, especially, you know, thinking about this in an American context, where, you know, we got rid of the monarchy 300 years ago. What is, what does that mean for, for a relationship, right? What, what does it mean to think about God as king in a world where we don't have kings? Or, because many people are not joining us from the United States, or maybe you do have a, a king or queen, Beloved, yeah, wonderful. I'm just looking to see if there's other things, right? Leia points out that these metaphors are really important, that we have, as humans, you know, human brains maybe struggle to understand the fullness of what God is, which makes sense because the rabbi's understanding of God is one that is beyond what human brains can process. And so these metaphors are really important ways for us to access, um, to access who God is in relationship to us. But I guess what I want to end with, because I know we're running out of time, is we also have to understand that metaphors have meaning, right? That when we use a metaphor, it also tells us something about how we can best approach these ideas, um, right? About about the parallels 
that we see out there that can help us understand what's going on in the universe. And so words have meaning. And I think what we're seeing today, even in the Talmud is, we use certain metaphors, but when we actually sit with them, they might be more complicated than we thought. Um, they might be more troubling than we thought. They might be an invitation to say, okay, this is one metaphor among a cluster. Are there other metaphors we wanna highlight? Are there other, other metaphors we wanna look at together with these metaphors? Because even for the rabbis, right, we, we just had this one simple verse in 23a, which one simple sentence in 23a, which I thought was amazing because, you know, so often we, we aren't sure what rabbis think. We don't know. No, they tell us it is better not to be enslaved. And so what does that mean for how we think about our relationship with God? Um, so I'm going to end there. I'm going to wish you all a wonderful week. I'm not going to see you, uh, I think, before the holidays. So I wish you a Shana Tova, um, a happy and sweet new year. And uh, and I look forward to our next week together in the DAF. Thank you much, Dr. Sarah. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.